What's up respiratory therapists? Hey, or future respiratory therapists, I just want to give you a shout out real quick and just say hi. I hope you guys had a great week of clinicals. I know everybody's in school and and you may have had exams this week. You may have had clinicals this week. You may have had a great week. You may have had a terrible week, but I just want to give you words of encouragement that say, hey, stick with it, okay? You're learning. You're figuring out the right way to do things. And that's what it's all about, okay? So what I want to talk about real quick here is a conversation that I had. Not really a conversation, but just a question that was posed to me. And I said, hey, can you talk about vent management in regards to COPD and asthma? Okay, now first of all, those are two completely different disease processes, okay? So it's hard to talk about those separately while talking about vent management. Okay, because because there's they're, they're, they're just not the same. Okay, and so if if you think COPD and asthma present the same, what you're doing is in your mind you're thinking these are both obstructive lung diseases which will prevent air leaving the lungs, and they're going to be treated the same, but they're not. Okay, so don't 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 confuse these two like this is the same vent management for both of them. But in the end, there is one common denominator, okay? And that is if you consider them both obstructive lung diseases, which they are, when you think of your obstructive lung diseases, you're thinking of C-babe diseases, which is chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, asthma, cystic fibrosis, and emphysema. Those are your five obstructive lung diseases. And you have to understand that all of those diseases present you with a situation where the patient is going to have trouble getting their air out okay it's it's, it's not a problem of having small tidal volumes because they can't get air in they can get air in the problem is when they go to get their air out okay so i want to focus on that right now when you're talking about copd asthma or any of your c babes when it comes to mechanical ventilation what you need to understand is that the biggest problem with this population of patients is that they can't get air out. Okay, so they're going to be at a tendency to air trap. All right, now how do I distinguish air trapping from something else? Well, the answer is very simple. You look at your flow scalar graphic. Okay, it's going to look something like this that I have here on the board. Okay. You're going to look at that and you're going to look at it and analyze it and ask yourself, is my flow returning to baseline? And if it's not, then that's how you know that the patient is air trapping. So remember this gold standard is flow doesn't return to baseline, which means your patient is air trapping, which is usually indicative of an obstructive lung disease okay now i got on a board here just a simple flow graphic when you look at it if your your, your patient comes like this okay forget i drew that okay but if your patient looks like this and you have failure to return to baseline on the expiratory flow side of things then that is air trapping. That means you need to give them a longer expiratory phase. Okay. Now, typically, if you're in a volume mode of ventilation, then you can easily do this by increasing your flow. Increasing your flow will decrease your eye time, will increase your E time. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now, you can do other things. You can decrease your tidal volume. Decreasing your tidal volume will decrease your eye time and increase your E time. You can decrease your rate. Decreasing your rate will extend your total cycle time, which in a volume mode of ventilation increases your E time. Okay, but that's typically not the first route you want to take because both of those decreasing tidal volume and decreasing rate will both decrease your minute ventilation. And if you decrease your minute ventilation, 
then you're going to increase your CO2 and drive your pH down. You don't want to do that. Okay. So the goal here is how do we shorten I time and allow for a longer E time without affecting minute ventilation? And your answer in that lies in increasing your peak inspiratory flow. Okay, so if you're on a flow of 40, increase them to 60. If you're on a flow of 60, increase them to 70 or 80. Okay, now understand that this is going to increase your peak inspiratory pressure. But if you look at your plateau pressures, you should be able to watch and see what's happening at the parenchyma. If you have a high peak inspiratory pressure with a low plateau pressure, then all of your peak inspiratory pressure is primarily coming from your airway resistance, which is common in your asthmatics. Okay, so don't be don't be afraid to turn up the flow on your asthmatics because you're afraid of peak inspiratory pressures if your plateau pressures are healthy. When I say healthy, I'm talking about less than 30 centimeters of water pressure. Okay, and so. That's what it comes down to. This is not rocket science. This is pretty basic mechanical ventilation. If your flow doesn't return to baseline, then you have air trapping. How do you fix air trapping? You make their E time longer. What's the easiest way to do that? Increase your peak inspiratory flows when you're in volume ventilation. Okay. Now, if you're in pressure ventilation, you're controlling the eye time. You have an, a set eye time set, which means your E time is subsequent to that. So if you need to shorten your E time, uh, you, sh sorry, if you need to shorten your eye time, then shorten your eye time. But understand that shortening your eye time will decrease your volume delivered, and that will affect minute ventilation. So this isn't something that is is it, it to, to me it's pretty simple 20 years in the field eight years in, in education is pretty simple but to students it's not so simple okay you always have to take in regards what your minute ventilation is going to be and how it's going to be impacted by the changes you make okay so if it decreases your minute ventilation but extends your e time if that allows for better gas exchange and promotes a better ABG, then do that. But if decreasing I time re results in an E time that is longer, but in a decrease in your minute ventilation, then you have to take that into account. Okay. The other thing you can do when you're dealing with COPD and asthma is you can consider increasing PEEP. Increasing PEEP will hopefully stint open those airways that are collapsing, especially with COPD, and allow for more complete emptying of the lungs and, and ultimately decrease overall air trapping. Okay? So this, this, is, this is a real basic, a real rough explanation of obstructive lung diseases on the ventilator. The primary concern you have is are you allowing enough time for exhalation? And if you're not, then it's going to show up on your flow scalar graphic as the expiratory flow not returning to baseline. If it was going to return to baseline, it would look like this. Okay? Now you're returning to baseline and you're not air trapping and you're not concerned with this patient in, a, in, in regards to air trapping. But if you look at your flow graphics and you see this, that is air trapping every single day, all the time, and you need to give your patient more time to exhale. What's the simplest way to do that? Increase your flow. Increasing flow will decrease eye time, will extend E time, and give more time for exhalation. Okay, guys, hope this helps. Give me comments. Let me know what you need. I'd love to respond to you. Have a great day.